Well, good morning, church. Uh, if you don't know who I am, my name is Cameron. I'm the Young Adults Pastor here at CGCC, and it is a joy uh, to once again uh, share God's Word with you this morning. Uh, now, if you're not aware, we're going to be taking a couple of weeks break from our series in Corinthians as we kind of celebrate this Easter uh, period. And today, those some of you know, is Palm Sunday. But also know that some of you probably have no idea what Palm Sunday is. Palm Sunday is a celebration often celebrated by Protestants and Catholics um, and really looking at the, the celebration of Jesus' triumphal entry into uh, Jerusalem. And so we're actually going to do that today as well. We're going to focus on that particular passage and we're going to look at Matthew's account in Matthew chapter 21. And so I want you to open there in your Bibles, uh, because we're going to go through this uh, section of text verse by verse. So I just encourage you, as always, to have God's Word in front of you as we uh, get going today. But why don't we pray before we do? Heavenly Father, we come before you now, and we pray that you reveal your words to us through your Son and by the power of your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, one of the things you very quickly learn as a parent is that kids generally don't mind hearing the same story over and over again. In fact, that is their preference to hear the same story over and over again. And, and, you know, I love the story we're going on a bear hunt, but I feel like it's ingrained in my very soul. And I only have one kid, so please pray for me as I keep reading that book over and over again. But kids love that. They love the same story. They never get tired of it. But us, on the other hand, we get a bit tired of the same old story. Well, today we're going to be approaching a very familiar story. And the temptation for everyone here will be to allow its familiarity to cause you to miss its beauty. To allow how familiar this passage is to cause you to forget that our hearts actually need the same truth over and over and over again, that our hearts quickly become dull and passionless about the truths that we believe. And so I encourage you this morning, even though this is a familiar passage, to be prepared to see the beauty of your Saviour, of our Saviour, all over again. Now, this story of Jesus' triumphal entry is in all four of the Gospels, and so it's clearly a very significant moment in Jesus' ministry. And one thing you'll notice as you read the different accounts in the different gospel letters is that each of them kind of bring out a different aspect of this entry, and they do that to suit their overall purpose. And so as we look at Matthew today, we're going to see that two of the big themes in Matthew has been fulfillment. He's all about showing that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament promises, But also another big theme of Matthew is the indictment on the current religious system led by the Pharisees. And so as we come to this text, we're going to see these elements come out. But what also we know is that Matthew is a letter predominantly written to a Jewish audience. And so there's a lot of history in the minds of the readers. And so why don't we begin reading? We're just going to read the first verse of Matthew 21. Um, Chapter, yeah, chapter 21, verse 1, says this. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples. Now, I want to pause there because I want to set up the scene of what's going on here. Because as I said, predominantly it was a Jewish audience. And so it's easy for us to skip out on some of the important details in what is being said here. So just a couple of things to notice. Firstly, notice that Jesus is heading towards Jerusalem. Now, if you know Matthew, you'll know that Jesus hasn't been to Jerusalem yet. In fact, even though Jesus has been outspoken against the religious leaders and the Pharisees, he hasn't actually confronted them full on. He hasn't gone to the heart of their worship. And so this entry into Jerusalem actually signals a shift in Jesus' ministry. In a sense, the gloves are now off. Jesus is not going to hold back. He's going to the very heart of the corrupt system that the Pharisees were leading. And we'll see that in a couple of chapters, right? In the famous Olivet Discord, he's going to call the Pharisees 
uh, whitewashed tombs. He's going to call them serpents. He's going to say that, that they won't enter the kingdom of heaven and they're actually blocking other people from entering it too. And so the gloves are off now as Jesus enters into Jerusalem. He's not holding back. But the second thing to notice is Matthew's deliberate mention of the Mount of Olives. Now, this was a mountain east of Jerusalem, and it would have triggered something in the minds of his readers. It's not used a lot in the Old Testament. It's actually only used a couple of times. But I want us to look quickly at the way it's used, because I think Matthew wants them to connect the dots. So you see, Mount of Olives is only explicitly mentioned once in the Old Testament, and that's when David's son, Absalom, wrestles control of the kingdom off him. And we read this in 2 Samuel 15, 30. David continued up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. His head was covered, and he was barefoot. All the people with him covered their heads too, and were weeping as they went. Now, if you know the story of David, you'll know this is the low point of David's whole life. He's experiencing the consequences of his own sin with Bathsheba, where God promised that his family would be against each other, that there would be ruin in his family, and what is worse than his own son overthrowing the throne, taking it from him, and then here is David weeping up the Mount of Olives. But it's also mentioned a second time in 1 Kings 11.7, where we read this about Solomon, the son of David. On a hill east of Jerusalem, which was the Mount of Olives, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. And so again, not a very glorious picture of this mountain near Jerusalem. The son of David himself is building idols, uh, building uh, temples to these idols. He's setting it up to these detestable gods of Molech and, and Chemosh. And then finally, one other time it's mentioned in Ezekiel, we see that the glory of the Lord departs from Jerusalem just before the invasion from Babylon and settles on a mountain east of Jerusalem. And so all of these verses would have seen this Mount of Olives as associated with very negative parts of Israel's history. The king, the greatest king they had, David, weeping suffering the consequences of his sin. The son of David, Solomon, building to these false gods on the Mount of Olives and the glory of the Lord departing and settling there. So with this in mind, let's keep reading from verse 2. Saying to them, to his two disciples, go into the village in front of you and immediately you'll find a donkey tied and a colt with her Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a beast of burden." Okay, so this is where things get a little bit interesting in this passage. We see Jesus command his disciples to go into this village and to go and get some donkeys. And to tell the owner of these donkeys, the Lord has need of them and he'll bring them right back. Now, I don't know about you, I've always laughed at that bit. It just sounds funny if you imagine being the owner of those donkeys. Someone comes up to you and says, I just need to borrow your donkeys, but the Lord needs them and I'm going to bring them back. I don't know if I would buy that, to be honest. But it raises the question, why the donkeys? And Matthew, in typical Matthew style, he wants to show that everything is happening is linked to the fulfillment of the Old Testament promises. And so he quotes these verses from Zechariah 9.9. And I want us to turn there. So turn to Zechariah 9.9, because I think it helps us to see the weight of what's going on here by reading through this prophecy for ourselves. So I'll wait five minutes as you find... Zechariah in your Bibles. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, says this. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. 
I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. And so this was one of the most famous prophecies in the minds of the Jewish readers. It was well known. But notice some interesting things about it. First of all, notice that this prophecy is all about the true king of Israel finally coming. It says that he is righteous and bringing salvation. And when you read that, and when Israel would have read that, when they were under attack constantly from the nations around them, they would have read that in the context of finally a king who's going to bring salvation, who's going to free us from the enemies around us, the enemies of the nations. But then the next line says that this king is coming humble on a donkey. In fact, the fowl of a donkey. Now, it goes without saying that this is not a warrior image. This is not a a war horse, but it's a donkey, an animal only ridden in times of peace. And so the imagery is interesting. And then in verse 10, it gets even more interesting because he says that this humble king on a donkey is going to cut off the chariot and the war horse. And so somehow this king on a donkey is going to achieve military might over the war horse, over the chariot. It kind of doesn't make sense. And then, I guess, to make it even more extreme, we see that actually this king on a donkey is going to achieve military might and he's going to speak peace to the nations. Peace to the nations. He's not going to overthrow the nations. He's going to speak peace to the nations. And so all this interesting imagery is going on in this prophecy, and they would have had this firmly in their minds. And so jump back to Matthew 21. With that in mind, we're going to keep reading. Look at verse 6, as Israel's king is about to enter into Jerusalem. Verse 6 says this, The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up. And so the disciples, they obey Jesus, they bring this donkey, and Jesus gets on the colt, the youngest one who's never been ridden before, and he rides into Jerusalem. And what's the response? Well, basically, everyone goes crazy, right? Initially, those following Jesus spread their cloaks and cut branches from the trees. This is where we get the imagery of Palm Sunday from. And they lay them before Jesus. And then when he finally enters into Jerusalem, the crowd erupts in verse 11. In fact, the ESV version says that they were stirred up, but it's actually not a very good translation in my opinion. The word behind stirred is actually used for earthquakes and apocalyptic upheaval, and so I like the way the NET version says that the whole city was thrown into an uproar. I think this kind of captures what's going on here. The crowd is going crazy over Jesus entering into Jerusalem. And notice what they are shouting. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now often in this passage, there will be a lot of attention on the word Hosanna, which we know means save. But I actually think there's a more important phrase that Matthew includes here, and that is the son of David. Matthew deliberately uses this term Son of David. Because you see, this was a loaded statement. Perhaps more than other titles, this was a messianic title, pointing to Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah. You see, this language harkens back to 2 Samuel 7, where God promises David that he will always have a son on the throne. Eternally, his son will reign. The son of David will reign forever. And so this imagery was associated with the coming king. 
But it's even more significant, again, there's a lot of things for us to see under the surface, when we realise who the last person was to ride a donkey in Israel's history. Well, it comes from 1 Kings 1.33, and surprise, surprise, the last person to ride on a donkey and crowned king was the son of David, Solomon. 1 Kings 1.33 says this, And the king said to them, Take with you the servants of the Lord, and have Solomon, my son, ride on my own mule, and bring him down to Gihon, and let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet there anoint him king over Israel, then blow the trumpet and say, Long live King Solomon. So we see here the son of David, Solomon, rides this donkey, not a war horse. Why? Because this is the one moment in Israel's history where they had peace. The one moment where they were at rest. So Solomon rides this donkey. And yet this is where the connections come together. Because what happens? Well, we know, right? Solomon messes it up. Solomon completely messes it up. His peace is short-lived because of his own sin. And they would have associated that with the Mount of Olives, right? Here's this great son of David, Solomon, riding on this donkey, and yet moments later, building to the false idols on the mountains near Jerusalem. And so I think what Matthew's doing here is he wants us to see the contrast. Here comes Jesus as the better king, the better King David, the the better Solomon, the one who is actually going to, to be perfectly obedient to his father, the one who is going to be the perfectly obedient king, whose kingdom will truly never end, unlike Solomon. You see, this passage signifies the true king, not only over Israel, right? We read that in the prophecy. His rule will be to the ends of the earth. This passage is about a king who rules over the entire creation. And yet, it's a particular type of king, right? Because as I said before, there's there's every evidence to say that as Jesus rode into Jerusalem, the crowds actually recognised to some extent that this was the king, that this was the Messiah. You see that? They wouldn't say son of David. They wouldn't rejoice before him if they didn't to some extent recognise who this was. And so they understood the kingship of Jesus, but they didn't understand the donkey. That this humble king was about to be crowned ruler over all things through a cross. And we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, because despite all the prophecies, despite all the anticipation of Israel, they could not fathom a king who would be crowned through his death. They could not fathom a king who would not conquer by military might, but by a cross. In fact, a theologian by the name of Jeremy Treat has written about this, and he shows that Jesus' crucifixion and the lead-up to it, it actually resembles a coronation ceremony. As Jesus puts on the crown of thorns and the purple robe, as he gets the title, the King of the Jews, it's showing that Jesus is actually receiving his kingship through a cross. This is how this humble king receives his kingship. And he will bring peace to the nations, not the peace that the people want, but peace from the true enemies of sin and death. This is the king, and this is our king. And so this is our first point. Jesus is the true king over all. And it took us a bit to get there, but there's a lot of beautiful imagery behind this. And we need to feel the weight of it. And so I think the only really application point I can ask at this point is, is this your king? Is Jesus the king of your life? Is Jesus still the king of your life? And to be honest, sometimes I think we can think about it when we say, do you believe in this king? And we can think, well, yes, of course, I believe that Jesus is king. And we think that that just means assenting to kind of an understanding of Jesus being king. But I think we miss something if we think of it like that. I think sometimes a more helpful way to think about it is this question. Is your allegiance to this king? 
Is your allegiance to this king? Like, as believers, we have been transferred from one kingdom to another kingdom, from one king to another king, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, from the kingdom of self to the kingdom of the king of all things. Are our whole lives ruled by this king? Like, is he the one who dictates your life? Because I think it's easy to say, yes, I believe this statement that Jesus is king, and yet our lives not to be in total submission to this king. True belief has this element of, I'm all in. My allegiance is to a new king and a new kingdom. And so is this your reality? Maybe you sit here this morning having never given your whole life to Jesus. Or maybe you sit here this morning and realize today that there's some aspects of your life that you're beginning to rule over yourself again. Because isn't that the nature of our hearts? That even though we acknowledge Jesus as King, our hearts quickly seek to reign over aspects of our life. And so what this morning, as you sit here, As you think about your life, what might you be trying to grasp the reign over again? To be king over, to take control over again. I don't know what that is for you or what comes to your mind, whether it's your job or kids or money or a pursuit of something else. I don't, it could be anything. But there's an opportunity this morning to ask yourself that question. What areas of your life are you seeking to control that you need to resubmit to the king of all kings? To submit to his loving reign joyfully because he is the rightful king. What is that for you this morning? All right, well, let's keep moving because even though that's Often all we hear, I think there's more in this passage to see, particularly as we look at what's going to happen yet next. And I think Matthew wants us to see the fullness of who this king is. So, and I promise the next two points won't take as long. Look at verse 10 and 11. We read this. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Now, it's interesting to note with these two verses, only Matthew includes these verses in this triumphal entry. He's the only one who adds this little extra bit onto the end. And the question is, why? Why does he do it? And really, there's two possible answers to this question. The first one is that Matthew adds this in to show that Even though the crowds were really excited about Jesus, they didn't fully understand who he was because they just call him the prophet. And the prophet could just mean any prophet. It doesn't necessarily mean um, the long-awaited prophet. But I don't think this is necessarily the right option because Matthew just kind of leaves this hanging here. He doesn't say any negative comments about it. He kind of just leaves it there. And the crowd had already recognized and used this messianic language of this king And so I think a better option is the second option, that what Matthew is doing here, because one of his major themes is all about fulfillment, all about Jesus fulfilling Old Testament prophecy, I think Matthew places this here to show that not only is Jesus the true king, but also he is the true prophet. He is the one who not only fulfills all Old Testament prophecy, but he's actually the one who is the final word of God and the very revelation of the Father. He is the final prophet. Now, there may be both elements in this, but I think that Matthew wants us to see this, that Jesus is not only the true king, but he's also the true prophet. And again, this finds its roots in the Old Testament. Phil actually mentioned it this morning, that the people of Israel were awaiting a better prophet. And we read this in Deuteronomy 18.15. You can turn there if you want, but I find this passage so interesting. Deuteronomy 18.15 says this, The Lord your God, speaking to Moses, as of Moses, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you 
from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at, at Horeb, on the day of the assembly, when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire any more lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. And I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. And so you see this great promise to Israel that God will raise up a prophet from among their brothers who would reveal what God wants. You see, the Israelites, they couldn't stand this, this God who was so, so transcendent, so amazing, so terrifying. They thought they were going to die when they heard his voice, right? So they wanted someone flesh of their flesh, someone from their own nature who they could listen to, who could tell them exactly and clearly what God wants. And so Jesus is this prophet, He's a prophet from among them. He is born, literally, God in the flesh, in the line of David, a prophet from among their brothers, finally to speak to them about exactly what God wants. Jesus is the true prophet. And he's revealed to us not only what God's word says, but he's revealed to us the Father himself. He is the exact imprint and nature of God. When we see Jesus we see the Father. And that's why, as God's people, why we center ourselves upon the Word of God. That we come to God's Word by the Spirit, through the Son, that in these words we see what God has to say. That through these words we see Jesus as our true prophet and the one who reveals the Father to us. And so, if the first question was, is Jesus our true king, then the second question needs to be, is Jesus our true prophet? Is the word that Christ has revealed to us, the word that he has brought to us, the centre of our lives? The scripture that testifies to him as he reveals to his disciples on the road to Emmaus. Is this word central to our lives? Or maybe our hearts have become dull to the fact that Israel longed for a prophet who was like them, longed for a prophet who could reveal what God wanted, and we know that prophet in Christ, and he has revealed to us what God wants. Have our hearts become dull to the fact that we have the very words of Christ to us? Jesus is the true king, and Jesus is the true prophet. And I think Matthew wants us to see this, to see the beauty of this. But there's one other aspect that I want us to bring out this morning, and it's in the very next scene, and perhaps you already know where I'm going. But why don't we look at verse 12? We're going to read the next section of Matthew 21. Because what's the first thing that this king Jesus is going to do after he enters Jerusalem? Well, look at verse 12, and we'll read right through to the end of 17. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that, Jesus, that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read, Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise? And leaving them there, he went out of the city to Bethany, and lodged there. Now, we don't have time to go into all the details of this passage, but I want to point out a couple of things. Again, notice that this is Jesus not holding back. 
This is the king, and the first thing he does is he goes straight into the temple, into the heart of the religious system led by the Pharisees, and he's going to march in there, and then he's going to, what does he do? He's going to get angry. And like, I don't know, if we're honest, do we like this image of Jesus? He flips over tables. Other um, versions say that he made a whip and that he drove out those who were selling things. Jesus kind of loses the plot here, right? I don't know what we think about this imagery of Jesus because sometimes I think we think he's just this gentle and passive guy, but here he is getting full on angry. But I think we forget something about who Jesus was, that Jesus is the perfect son of God, the sinless son of God, and he has spent his whole life around people who sin. His whole life has been spent around people who constantly sin against his father, the very father that he loves and worships, uh, the very father that he loves and submits to. And so it's not surprising. It's actually incredible that in the gospel, Jesus only gets angry twice. Two times, and yet he's surrounded by this sin all the time. And so I think we should pay attention to the places where he actually does get angry. And so the question is why? Why does Jesus react so strongly here when he hasn't gotten angry hardly at all throughout the Gospels? Well, I think there's three reasons why. The first we see in verse 13, his answer given to them, it is written... My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And so the first reason is because this whole temple, the whole purpose of the temple had been lost. You see, the temple had been made about profiting from the people rather than about prayer and seeking God. And so what was happening was the sacrifices that they were selling had become about making money, about monetary gain. And this is a repulsive to the one who is about to go and sacrifice himself for the sins of the people. The very people here, the religious leaders, the priests, the scribes, who were supposed to be helping people find God, were trying to profit off them and make it a burden. You see what Jesus means when he says that they're shutting the kingdom of God out from those who are seeking it. But secondly... All of this activity was happening in, and you might have heard this before, in the court of the Gentiles. This is actually where the nations were meant to come to see the God of Israelite, Israel and worship him. And yet, this is where all this stuff is happening. And it shows that Israel had a disregard for those who, were out, who weren't Israelites. It shows that they'd forgotten that the original promise to Abraham was that they were meant to be a blessing to all nations, and yet they'd become a curse. They were shutting people out of the kingdom of God. And finally, we should see that Jesus getting so angry here in that he drives them out. Like, I think we need to pause and think about what that means, that Jesus is driving out those who are selling sacrifices that they were meant to sacrifice to God. He's bringing here an indictment upon the whole sacrificial system and what it had become. And by doing that, by driving them out of the temple, Jesus is showing that he is instituting a new sacrificial system, that he himself is going to be the sacrifice. He steps into the temple as the true temple, the one whose body as the temple is going to be torn down and risen up in three days to bring in this new system. And so you can see what Matthew is trying to show us here, another aspect of who Jesus is. Immediately after he drives them out, in verse 14, the blind and the lame, they come to him and they're healed. And finally, the needy, the the, the ones who need healing, are receiving healing in the temple. And so I want you to see that not only is this displaying to us that Jesus is the true king and the true prophet, but by what's happening here, by him entering the temple, driving out the sacrificial system, healing those who are sick, healing the lame, he's showing that he is also the true priest. The priest who won't pay for his own sins, 
but that will take the sins of the people upon himself and die. This is the true priest. And is this our priest also? Is he the one whom we come for, for the forgiveness of sins? Is he the one who brings us to the Father? Or have we started to rebuild the very system that he sought to destroy? A system of trying to come before God by our own efforts and by our own works and by our own means. Our hearts, just like they're prone to, to, to rule over certain aspects of our life, our hearts are just as prone to rebuild this system to build ourselves up by our own works, but also to shut others out of the kingdom of God, to make a type of person that Jesus came to save. Is your heart starting to rebuild what Jesus came to tore down? Do you see the beauty of this great high priest who has entered in on our behalf? You see, this is who we celebrate on this Palm Sunday. This is what the triumphal entry is showing us. It shows us Christ. It shows us that he is the true king, the one who rules over all creation, that he is the true prophet, the one who brings the final word of God, the revelation of the Father, and he is the true priest, the priest who willingly dies for his people. And so to finish with, I don't have really an application point other than to say to come and behold your glorious king, to come and once again behold your beautiful saviour. Because that's what we need most this morning. Just like the crowds who were thrown into an uproar, our hearts need to be thrown into uproar that this is the saviour, that this is the messiah, that this is the king. A saviour humble and riding on a donkey, a saviour who, who presents to us another opportunity, maybe for the first time or maybe just another day in your Christian walk, but an opportunity to submit to his loving reign. You have that opportunity today to submit to his loving reign. This is a chance for us to do that and to do that while Jesus is still, figuratively speaking, on that donkey. Because Jesus isn't always going to be on that donkey, right? Right? In fact, Revelation 19.11 presents to us a very different picture of Jesus. It presents to us a picture of, of Jesus who has traded his donkey for a war horse. And it says that he's coming to make war. This time he is coming to make war. And he's coming to make war on all sin and all sinners who have not submitted by faith to his loving reign. And so let us this morning... Submit out of joy to the king who paid the price for us. To our king, to our prophet, to our priest. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for uh, Palm Sunday. We thank you for uh, how this is an opportunity for us to look back on a very familiar passage and yet to realise that we need what is familiar because our hearts very quickly become dull to the truth of who Christ is. Our hearts very quickly try to reign over our own lives or aspects of our own lives. We need to graciously submit to you as our King. That we forget the words of life that we have, one who became like us to give us the very words of the Father. And also one who paid the price for our sins the ultimate high priest who went behind the curtain for us. Lord, I pray that this morning our hearts may worship you as king, that you may bring, I guess, revival in our own hearts this morning as we head up towards Easter uh, Friday and, and Easter Sunday. I pray that this week actually may be a week of celebration for us as we realize the victory that you've achieved through your cross and through your resurrection. So we just... Pray for your help in this, in Jesus' name. Amen.